Hello, everybody, and welcome to the inaugural Harvard Law School Rappaport Forum. Uh, 74 years ago, in the shadow of World War II, Jerry Rappaport, then an 18-year-old first-year law student, decided that aspiring lawyers needed a regular opportunity to engage with the ideas and issues that connect our study of law to a complex and dynamic world. For Jerry, this engagement with vital contemporary issues was an essential part of preparing new Harvard lawyers for the leadership roles that so many of our graduates assume. In 1947, he told the ABA Journal, and I quote, in this day, no one will seriously question the truth that one can think as a specialist only after one has qualified as a competent citizen of this changing world. It is that sense of civic duty and of the responsibility of leadership that inspired him to found the Harvard Law School Forum, a student-organized speaker series dedicated to public discourse. Held for many years at Harvard Sanders Theater and broadcast on WHDH at a time, by the way, when public affairs programming on radio was pretty rare, the forum's speakers addressed a range of subjects that were both urgent in their times and in many cases continue to be pressing today. On March 8, 1946, in the midst of the Nuremberg trials, the Harvard Law School Forum hosted its inaugural meeting. And the theme was war crimes, revolution in legal theory, or law enforcement. And this began a wonderful series at Harvard Law School of important conversations about consequential and difficult issues. Over the past seven decades, the forum's list of speakers reads like a who's who of post-war leaders, thinkers, and cultural icons, including Fidel Castro, John F. Kennedy, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Thurgood Marshall, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Caspar Weinberger. Nearly three quarters of a century later, we come together with Jerry Rappaport and Phyllis Rappaport to open a new chapter in this history. Through a generous gift of the Rappaport Foundation, we are able to build on that original vision by launching a new vehicle for robust discussion and debate, the Harvard Law School Rappaport Forum. As we'll see shortly, as soon as I stop talking, <laughs> um, the HLS Rappaport Forum is designed to promote full, open, vigorous, and respectful discussion about critical and complicated issues facing our community, our nation, and our world. With the launch of the Harvard Law School Rappaport Forum today, we hope to further several values. First, a great university must be a place of free, open inquiry, a place where disagreements, debates, and differences of opinion deepen knowledge and bring us closer to understanding and truth. Second, a great law school must be a place of free, open, and vigorous inquiry. A place where we differ about important things, but also listen generously to those with whom we disagree. You cannot, you cannot understand your best argument unless you understand the best argument against you. It's that simple. Finally, in a society that is badly divided, this forum will serve as a reminder of how important it is and how much can be learned from the respectful clash of ideas. With that, I want to thank Jerry and Phyllis Rappaport for cumulatively nearly 75 years of support for Harvard Law School, for their commitment to civic discourse, and particularly for their generosity in making this new 21st century forum possible. They model the type of engagement that we should all aspire to. So let's please give them a big thank you.
OK, now I have subsided. Um, and I would like to turn things over to my colleague, Professor Jeannie Sook Gerson, who will introduce today's topics and guest speakers. But before I do, I just want to thank Professors Barrett and uh, uh, Height for being here with us today, and Professor Gerson for moderating what I know will be a very interesting forum. Thank you. Today's forum asks, when is speech violence? and other questions about campus speech. All three of us have contributed in our writing and in public debate already about these questions in our own ways, coming from each of our different disciplinary backgrounds, as a neuroscientist, a social psychologist, and as a lawyer. And I am delighted to moderate this forum today, which puts Lisa Feldman Barrett in conversation to reflect on these questions with Jonathan Haidt and the questions that we are taking up today are about campus speech, but they're really more deeply about the nature, possibilities, and boundaries of discourse in our society. And given that this is taking place, this conversation is taking place in a law school with the law school audience, I do want to note that for law students, especially, who are about to go into the profession, and for lawyers who have practiced, the question of speech and violence and its connection is one that is particularly germane. Um, and I will remember at one of the first things that I learned in law school was from my criminal law teacher, Carol Steiker, who is here today, um, about the way in which, you know, following Robert, Robert Cover, we do have to understand that when lawyers speak, when they use words, what happens next is that someone either goes to prison or loses a job, or loses their child, or loses money. And these kinds of consequences are backed up only because violence, at the end of it, is possible, the, essentially the violence of the state. So I think that the, the connection between words and violence, it's not one that is uh, new to law students. And it's one that has come up in recent years with respect to speech in general, both campus speech in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And so I am very delighted that we are able to talk about some of these issues today with our two guest speakers. Let me introduce you. Lisa Feldman Barrett is the University Distinguished Professor of Psychology at Northeastern University. She is a neuroscientist uh, doing research at Mass General Hospital. She's also a lecturer in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Her research focuses on the nature of emotion from both psychological and neuroscience perspectives. She is the author of How Emotions Are Made, The Secret Life of the Brain. And she also has a forthcoming book, um, which I hope that we will be able to talk to her about um, when it comes out. Jonathan Haidt is the Thomas Cooley Professor of Ethical Leadership at NYU's Stern School of Business. He is a social psychologist whose research examines the intuitive foundations of morality. He's applied his research in a variety of settings, from helping people understand and respect the moral motives of people with whom they disagree, to asking how companies can structure and run themselves in ways that will be resistant to ethical failures. Professor Haidt is the co-author of, of the, the Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. So to introduce the topic, I'll start with a brief um, quote or paraphrase from each of you. Lisa, you have said that if words can cause stress and if prolonged stress can cause physical harm, then it seems that speech, at least certain types of speech, can be a form of violence. And Jonathan, you have said, a campus culture devoted to policing speech and punishing speakers is likely to engender patterns of thought that are surprisingly similar to those long identified by cognitive behavioral therapists as causes of depression and anxiety. So um, our purpose today is to take the care and the time to explore the context and the reasoning that led each of you to arrive at your views and to explore the reasons for your agreements and your disagreements. What is so great about your talking with us today is that increasingly it is the case that on campuses like ours, the question of speech is framed around the question of students' 
mental health and their physical health. And given that, I don't think we can have a conversation that is truly informed. Even though lawyers, as lawyers, we think we know how to talk about speech, um, I don't think that conversation can be informed without the kind of research and expertise that you bring to it. Um, and of course, the framing has consequences, and those consequences are the subject of disagreement. So let me start with a question. What does it mean to think of speech as violence? In what circumstances? Sure, OK. So I think the first thing to understand is that what we mean by violence. So um, harm, physical harm, to your brain or your body. So losing um, arborization of neurons. So the neurons become less bushy, and they uh, end up being more expensive to run. Or we're talking about an increase in um, metabolic dysfunction, which leads to heart disease, or diabetes, or depression, or other metabolic illnesses. So that's really what we're talking about. And it really is, I think, at this point, incontrovertible that chronic stress, not an instant of stress, but stress from which people do not recover, does get under the skin and cause biological harm. I think at this point there are really dozens, if not hundreds, of studies which show that this is really clear. And sometimes the harm takes uh, 10 or 20 years to show up, but the, but the relationships are pretty predictable. So when you go to the gym, as I'm sure we all do, um, you are stressing yourself. You, are, you have a flush of cortisol, um, you start to feel unpleasant because Really, our brains, one of the main reasons we have a brain is to regulate our bodies. There's a fancy name for this. Scientists call it allostasis. But I like to refer to it just as simply like a body budget. So your brain isn't budgeting money for your body. It's budgeting glucose and salt and water and so on. So it's running a budget. And when you exercise, or actually in any kind of stress, you're basically making a huge withdrawal. And then you have to replenish that um, budget. And if you do, that's a really good thing. In fact, stressing a nervous system regularly and allowing it to recover is actually really healthy, and it builds a really strong uh, body and mind. However, chronic stress is really where um, the brain starts to run a deficit uh, in its body budget. And you start to feel really unpleasant and you are at risk for various illnesses, and you will show, eventually, even brain atrophy in particular regions of the brain. So this is a sci these are scientific uh, studies that have been replicated, and as close to a fact as we would ever say if a scientist would ever claim that a fact exists. Because for us, you know, the world is full of probabilities. And the evidence shows, surprisingly, um, that words, Verbal aggression um, is as potent as physical aggression and sexual abuse by a non-relative. That's what the research shows. The research has linked words, verbal aggression, to brain atrophy, to metabolic illness, to just a whole host of things. So that doesn't mean that if someone says something that you don't like, uh, that somehow you will immediately uh, suffer from some kind of physical um, illness. But what it does mean, um, and if we look at the brain, we can understand why, because the, the network in your brain that processes um, language also regulates your nervous system, regulates your immune system, your endocrine system, uh, your autonomic nervous system, all the visceral systems, your heart, your lungs, everything. So the point here is only that... Um, that under some circumstances, particularly when people are already stressed, you know, your brain doesn't care what the cause of the stress is. It doesn't you know, sort things into piles, like, well, this is a social stress, and this is a physical stress. Your brain doesn't really care. Um, if you're chronically stressed, you are, um, words are more likely to add, to pile on, and add additional stress. That's hard for us. I think is a, a culture to accept because we um, have very strong beliefs about individual rights and freedoms. 
but the fact is we evolved a social dependent nervous system and sometimes whether we intend it or not, we actually can cause harm to people uh, with what we say. So what are, what are the consequences of that insight? that we can uh, cause harm by what we say. That is a, um, that's something that as a scientist you believe is established. I don't believe it's established. It is established. It is established. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, we all, we're all, you know, scientists are super careful about, we don't like the T word, you know, truth. Nobody likes to say the F word, you know, a fact. I mean, other F words are really okay, but not that one. Um, yeah, so, you know, we, we do try hard to understand that everything is complex and, you know, probabilistic and whatever, but when you have really many, many, many studies from many, many, many labs looking at many, many, many different types of people across many, many, many situations, you kind of get the sense that, you know, the idea that stress gets under your skin and affects um, your metabolism and your brain, I think at this point, is not debatable. Um, uh, and you can, there's just, I think at this point it's, you know, we would, I would feel comfortable calling it a fact, although even saying that just yeah. makes me kind of, right. yeah. And yeah. here, here, I think that here is one area where John, Jonathan, you're, you're not in disagreement with the idea that words can cause that kind of harm. No, I certainly agree uh, on that empirical claim. The question is what, uh, what implication that has for the proposition that words are violence. So uh, first let me just say, I've been, so I've been working on this issue of viewpoint diversity and how essential it is, um, especially since 2015 when I co-founded um, Heterodox Academy, an organization that advocates for more viewpoint diversity in the academy. And from the beginning, it's been really clear that there are two fields that, that or there are three fields that really, really get it. And so in addition to the social sciences in general, we talk about all kinds of controversial things. And, and Lisa's written beautifully on this. It wasn't mentioned, by the way, that Lisa is the president of the Association for Psychological Science, which is the major psychological organization for scientists. And she writes these beautiful columns um, about, uh, about uh, there's this wonderful line, and she has one called uh, Take an Aisle Seat, where she talks about a project she did um, deliberately meeting with people who have very different views on emotion uh, as she does. And actually, Lisa and I have, have debated on emotion as well. And, um, and she has this wonderful line about how you can turn your adversaries into your greatest scientific resource because it's only from having people challenge us that we actually get smarter. And so, um, uh, so I'm, I'm thrilled to, to be here talking with Lisa about this and she models what this is all about. But the three fields that really get it are social sciences, law, and journalism. Those three fields, the people I talk to, it doesn't matter if you're on the left or the right. Everybody, at least if they're over 30, it's a little different, it's a generational issue here, but everybody over 30 in those fields <laughs> agrees, and we'll talk about that, I hope, yes. agrees. You have, we, we are all so prone to motivated reasoning. We are all so good at coming up with post hoc arguments for whatever we believe that you cannot get at the truth in law, journalism, or the social sciences unless you put people together to talk in ways that challenge each other's priors and each other's confirmation biases. And that's what Jerry Rapport said in 1946, and that's what uh, Dean Manning said uh, just now. So we're all on board with this. Now, with regard to the specific claim that Lisa made about how words can cause harm. Absolutely, there's no dispute on that. But here's the, so Lisa wrote this up in an article in the New York Times, in an op in the New York Times, and, and she said, the syllogism that she just told you, she said, uh, if words can cause stress, and if prolonged stress can cause physical harm, then it seems that speech, at least certain types of speech, can be a form of violence. Well, um, I don't think that follows, because all that follows from that is if words cause stress and stress causes harm, then words cause harm. And we all agree with that. But a lot hangs on whether you will grant that harm to be a form of violence. Because the moment we say we all, we have a bright line on violence in our society. And, it, it, and the levels of it have been going down and down and down to the, to the present day, as Steve Pinker has shown. It's very, very important that we understand what violence is and that we all, we, we don't say, well, sometimes it's okay to use violence and sometimes not. No, we have an agreement. We don't use violence, especially within the academy, within, you know, violence is, is bad. And if we now say, well, you know what? If I say something and that causes you stress, and that stress causes you harm, then I have committed violence on you. Well, now you've opened a gigantic can of worms where we are all responsible for whether someone is upset by what we say. 
And not just that we're responsible, but that there are bureaucratic mechanisms that will enforce penalties upon us in universities everywhere. So that I now have to be very careful, and in fact, I do have to be extra careful in class, what I say, not because I'm afraid of committing violence on my students, but because there's so many mechanisms by which they can report me that I don't try to be provocative. Um, so I think it's extreme. So Lisa wrote this article. I reread on the plane up. I agree with just about everything in it. It's great. It's subtle. She gets the anti-fragility point. I mean, we're, we generally agree. Um, but I thought that she was opening up room for the students who want to say that speech that we don't like speech that we find not directly insulting, but speech that makes academic claims that we find to be threatening, that that is violence. To open, up, to open a door even a little bit to allow that claim in, I thought does an enormous disservice to universities and to the difficult, unnatural thing we are trying to do at universities, which is put people together to talk about things they disagree with, sometimes getting moralistic about it. We have to have norms that allow us to get together to confront each other uh, uh, and in that process find the truth. So I think that a lot hinges on um, what we think it means to say that something causes violence. Because the choice of the word, and I don't want to make this into a semantic debate, Right? Because I think there was a, there, a reason that, Lisa, you chose the word violence, um, which came up several times. And, and lots of people think of the concept of violence as useful here, as something that truly reflects their experience of hearing something that is truly offensive. And it's a way of making the moral argument that it should not be allowed, because we know we don't allow violence. And so if you call something violence, that's an argument that it should not be allowed. It, it, it is de facto an argument about regulation, as you just mentioned, that there, should, that there must be some bureaucratic means of dealing with this so that it doesn't happen. Surely we have rules that, so that students aren't being inflicted with violence on campus. So I think that it's a, it's a normative choice to use the term um, because it's not just saying that people are being harmed, um, like suffering. It's also saying that it's a kind of it's a it's a moral it's a moral claim to say speech is a form of violence. So, Lisa, what do you think about that? I mean, is does that and I think gets us back to what is a fact and what is value. So I feel that to some extent, like certain things are being conflated here. So to take the sentence out of context of that article that I wrote is somewhat problematic. I was making a very specific point about freedom of choice. That is, if our goal as educators is to expose our students to ideas that they don't like and might even find offensive, which is really what the whole article is about, actually, the importance of doing that. Um, and something, frankly, that I have dedicated my entire career to, as have you, and probably many of the educators in this room, um, then we have to be prudent about choosing speakers who will, to, for students to be exposed to, who will serve that goal. There are many people that you could have invited to speak here today, um, but you invited us. That doesn't mean that all the other people who weren't invited are being silenced or that their speech is being, uh, their freedom of speech is being imposed upon. No, we, we were chosen because we, we do have a history, a 20 year history of, um, uh, of being collegial uh, in moments where we disagree. That being said, the point of the article really was um, if you want to, um, foster this, if this is your goal, educationally, then you should be mindful about who you invite, um, who you choose to speak, uh, because some speakers do wield words as weapons. They do. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. And so I wasn't making a broad claim about anyone who says something that makes somebody else uncomfortable is uh, engaging in violence. I think that's really problematic. It's a bit of a straw man. I'm not saying that was your no. intent, but it is a bit of a straw man because here's just the basic, I will now use the word fact. We, um, <laughs> we, have, we evolved as a species to have socially dependent nervous systems. That means I can text three words to someone halfway around the world who can't hear my voice 
and can't see my face, and I can make their heart rate go up, I can make them breathe more quickly or more slowly, just by virtue of what those three words say. And if I do that, if you do that, if we all do that, which we do, we regulate each other's nervous systems. That means we are more responsible, actually, for people than we might like. We are also more responsible for ourselves than we might like because, when, because we're making inferences all the time about what someone else means. So we say, we, we say things in this culture like we read each other's body language and we read each other's faces, but we don't read anything. Our brains infer. So we are more responsible for ourselves than we might like, and we are more responsible for the impact we have on other people than we might like, and both of those things are biological facts. So I guess my, my feeling is that those issues need to be talked about separately. Um, there are certain conditions where words are uh, violence, I would claim, not the general case where um, you say something that someone finds offensive. I think that's a really a, a separate issue, which is also important and bears on the question of uh, how we function as educators to um, create a context for our students to do what we want them to do, which is to engage with difficult material that they might not like and that they might find unpleasant, but that nonetheless is important for informatively for the development of their minds. That's really a separate issue from don't consider not inviting someone who really does wield words as weapons because that is just, um, and that is a moral claim, I suppose, and that's just not productive um, for the goals that we have as educators. I just think of those as, as somewhat separate issues. Okay, uh, so um, um, I, you're right. I, if, if I gave the impression that you were saying, oh, you know, if, a, if someone's going to come and present ideas that are upsetting, well, the students would be right to call that violence. Uh, you definitely did not say that in your article. And to really give you credit, I thought you actually, um, the fact that you, you said that even Charles Murray, if he comes with, uh, you know, if he's coming as a, as a social scientist making arguments, um, uh, that you know that's legitimate. So Lisa definitely was not saying, oh, you know, anybody who's upset by something can claim it's violence. Um, so uh, so no, you're absolutely right about that. Now um, the question though is, um, what should we do about? We both agree that things can happen that speakers might come and say things that would be upsetting. We agree that there are different motives for speakers to come. And so Lisa draws the line. She says, uh, you know, Charles Murray speaking about data should absolutely be allowed, even if it's upsetting. Uh, whereas Miley Yiannopoulos, whose goal was trolling, and he said as much. He wrote all kinds of essays about, here's my goal, and, and here's why uh, I always win. He, he wrote things like that. Um, so uh, I think we what need- What does it mean to say your goal is trolling? Um, so as uh, Milo wrote an essay once where he basically explained that his goal is to make the left embarrass itself and then he would show up on campuses and then there are video, you know, people take videos um, of people overreacting. And you consider it out of bounds to try to embarrass people? So that's the question. What, do, what are we going to allow on campus? And so I think what we might want to do is, while we can agree that words can cause harm, I think we should think about what is the overall parameters what is the overall parameter in which we invite speakers? What are we doing? And here, I think, I think we're like, well, let's see. Let's see if we end up at the same place. I think we're going to come up with a different framework. So my framework, what I've found as I've been talking about this since 2015, is that arguments over free speech and where to draw the line are often fruitless and frustrating. Um, that if you want to talk about uh, what speech should be allowed in the public square and what speech you should be arrested for, Great, First Amendment, I'm thrilled that I live in a country with First Amendment freedom of speech, that's appropriate. Um, but on campus, I think it makes a lot more sense to focus on what is our, our telos, or purpose? What are we trying to do? And I found that this simple move clarifies things so much. When you're talking about speech, always look at what's the institution, what's the, what's the organization that we're talking about? Is it, a, is it a publicly traded company? Well, then of course you don't have a right. If you work for Coke, you shouldn't be allowed to go out and say how terrible Coke is. And you know you can be fired for that. That seems appropriate to me. 
But a university is very, very different. A university, um, Artilos, is uh, right there on the Harvard crest. It's truth, it's veritas. And it's a very special kind of social organization, uh, you know, worked out in, in a grove of olive trees outside of Athens long ago, 2,400 years ago, because you can't have, there's all kinds of conversations you can't have in the public square with an audience. You can't raise provocative ideas if there's an audience that will kill you um, or, or file blasphemy charges against you. So you have to have a special place. You know, called, Plato called it the academy. Um, and we think of universities as, we used to think of them as being like ivory towers where certain kinds of speech could happen. Unfortunately, with social media, every place is now the public square. And this is being live streamed, so I have to be very careful what I say. Um, but once you realize that what we're doing here together is this unnatural difficult thing of trying to overcome our biases, canceling out each other's biases, and getting at a higher good, which is the truth, now you can say, okay, what kind of speech norms should we have? What speech norms are conducive to that telos? And if our telos is truth, then those speech norms should be things like, your claims have to be backed in evidence. You can't just come here and say, you know, oh, the, you know, the Newtown shooting never happened. Like, you know, you can say that in America, but there's no point of having that be on a college campus. Um, and so I think we all agree that a, a scholar who has, presents work that some people find horrible or hateful or upsetting is still playing by those rules and should be allowed, is a legitimate person to invite. Uh, but now what about a person who's a provocateur? What about a person whose goal is to cause a reaction among the students? And what I fear is that we kind of have this norm that if it's coming from the right, then it's bad. But of course, provocateurs from the left are good. When I went to Yale in the early 80s, we had all kinds of playwrights and activists and people who were not scholars, were not presenting evidence-backed ideas. They were provocative, and that was great. And so I think, yeah, I would, I, I don't, um, I mean, if someone is spewing hatred directly, you know, yeah, then it's a, another story. Um, but even if someone is, a troll. I'm not saying they should be invited, but I can see that there, there could even be something useful about having students engage with it, and that would be a short-term stressor, not a chronic stressor. Well, I think it would be a short-term stressor for some people. I think, so I just want to be really clear. I agree with almost everything that you said. I really do. Um, and I, I really think it's important that people understand that we're talking about fairly subtle distinctions here, yeah. but fairly subtle distinctions that are actually crucially important to the lives of many, 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 many people in this country and probably elsewhere. And that is this, that um, you, mean you could just say, well, does someone like Mayo Yiannopoulos really um, fit our telos? I would just say no. And so invite someone else, right? I mean, you, that's our, it's a freedom of choice issue and it's, really, it's a really a pedagogical issue. But I, I think there's a subtler point here that I think is really important. Um, and that is, um, I do think that we should have speech norms where we don't deliberately shame people and embarrass them and if that's the goal. That doesn't mean that you're responsible when someone feels ashamed necessarily. Right? But I do think that actually talking to, we do have developed a casual brutality in our culture that we now accept as the norm. There's really interesting research that's been done at Michigan State University that quantifies the number, average number of um, moments of bullying and verbal aggression in sitcoms, which is once every four minutes, to a laugh track. Okay, so this is shaming and bullying to a laugh track where um, uh, the person who's the victim of this bullying shows no effect whatsoever. And adolescents then mirror that actually by increasing speaking that way. And I won't even talk about poli politics and what happens yeah. on the internet. <laughs> but I do, you know, I mean, we are, again, I, I do think that, that um, there is, it's important to make a distinction between what your intent is as a speaker and what someone feels, which you are not responsible for what someone else feels. On the other hand, we are educators. Our job as educators is to create a context where students can learn. That's our job. And if they learn, that is their um, success. And if they don't, they are partly responsible for that. And it's our job to teach them that. But I think we really also have to recognize that chronic stress, 
I mean, uh, is uh, a little more rampant than uh, we might think, right? What is the proportion of students on college campuses who are food insecure? What is the proportion of students on campuses who are housing insecure? What is the proportion of students on college campuses who feel physically safe on college campus in the evening versus in the day? I mean, you'd really be surprised at the numbers. What is the proportion of people who are depressed? And by that, I don't mean, gee, I'm not feeling good today. I mean clinically depressed, which is a metabolic illness. It is a metabolic illness that has very serious implications for health. It's an epidemic. The World Health Organization projects that in 10 years, depression will overtake heart disease as a major killer worldwide. So these are the students. I'm not saying everyone, and I'm also not denying the fact that there are some very robust, resilient people. But I am saying that there is some non-trivial proportion of people who are in our classrooms who come there already encumbered and they are not prepared to do what we want them to do. That doesn't mean that we're doing violence to them, but it does mean that the context is not conducive for us to really meet our goal as educators. And frankly, I do actually um, think about that when I am educating my students. In, not in the sense that I ever, I mean, I don't actually avoid difficult questions uh, or topics uh, for fear that um, I will be um, sanctioned. I just, you know, do it and then worry afterwards and hope that no one reports me. Um, but, um, but I usually tell students why we're doing this. And I warn them, you're going to feel uncomfortable now. In fact, I warn all my graduate students, if in the five years that you were with me in the lab, if you don't at some point put your head in your hands and start crying and wondering what the hell you're doing here, your life is miserable, why did you choose this? You're not doing it right. <laughs> so learning is hard. Facing um, you know, topics we don't like is hard. But the truth is, honestly, that some of us are better equipped just because of our life circumstances to do it than others. And that doesn't mean that we play violins for those people. And it doesn't mean that it, they're off the hook for any responsibility. But it does mean that there's a context here. And we would do well as educators to pay attention to that context, or we won't actually meet the goal that we have. Do you want to go ahead? Actually, yeah, I just want. Um, um, so yeah, as in so much of this, Lisa and I agree on the basic psychology, but we disagree on some of the implications. And so we, we're both very aware of the, of the research on the incredibly fast rise in depression and anxiety, especially for Gen Z, for, uh, for people born after about 1995. A lot of people are coming to campus different from what we were used to early in our careers. Um, and uh, they, are, they are in many ways fragile. And then the question is what to do about that. And I think the implication of, of, of what Lisa is saying is we have to do more, given that students are more fragile, we have to do more to remove stressors, uh, verbal stressors, things that could be upsetting, things that could add up think to. I, I don't think I actually said that. But Do you think something should be done to recognize this difference? Perhaps it's a generational difference. Well, I mean, yeah, I think students shouldn't, I don't think anyone should be food insecure, and I don't think that they should be worrying about where they're going to sleep, and I don't think that they should have the debt that they have to carry. And um, I'm not saying we have to do anything about that, but I do think it's, I think if it's a, it's a human capital issue. If we want to educate, if we want to uh, take advantage of the human brains that we have and educate them to do great innovative things, as a society, we should be paying attention to that. But if what you're asking is, I, I mean, I have people here from my lab, they can tell you, we don't ever shy away from difficult topics. Right. However, I do think that there is a way to um, address those topics with students, um, understanding that some of them might not be prepared, uh, uh, they might not be prepared uh, to deal with the consequences of the, their nervous systems are already encumbered, they're likely to be more stressed by it. And not, that doesn't mean that they are off the hook. It means that uh, we as educators have to do something different. Well, I'll just give you one example. I'm, I'm originally Canadian. I am actually an American citizen now. But uh, 
when I came here, uh, the first position that I held uh, had a training program for minority graduate students. Um, and as part of this training program, uh, I was teaching a course on clinical assessment, because originally my degree is actually a clinical psychologist. And as part of that, I had to teach eugenics, the eugenics movement in psychology, which is a very touchy subject. Um, and I also had to teach statistics, because the way I taught clinical assessment, students were required to understand statistics. And some of the students in the training program were not prepared, not prepared. And they felt that I was being unfair to them by holding them to the same standard as I held all the other students, which to me confused me. It's like, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm treating all the students the same, and I'm, I'm holding everyone to unreasonably high standards. So how is that unfair? And being from Canada, I didn't really understand the way taxation works here and the distribution of taxes to schools. And I didn't understand. There were a lot of things I didn't understand. So uh, I did the only thing that I could think of, which is I went to the only uh, faculty member of color in my department and said, will you explain what the hell is going on? I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. And then he very graciously explained it to me. And I went back to the students. I didn't say, well, you don't have to struggle. You don't have to feel bad about this. You don't have to work as hard as everybody else. I basically said, I understand that I understand some of you aren't prepared to deal with this material. You just don't have the background. So I'm going to hold you the same standards as everybody else. But I will work with anybody, take any amount of time it will take, uh, in order to get you up to speed. I will hold remedial classes. I will you know, tutor you, I will do, but, and I don't really, it wasn't concerned to me that students, those students were going to struggle a little harder, but in the end they had to meet the same standards. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that our students, not everybody, but a substantial portion of our students are really stressed. They happen to be also probably the more vulnerable students. That doesn't mean I'm saying everybody's fragile. I'm saying we have socially dependent nervous systems. Those nervous systems uh, if we want them to learn what, you know, if we want to meet our goals as educators, we just have to acknowledge the fact that people are stressed. And that has a real translatable implication for how we deal with them. It doesn't mean that we let them off the hook, but it does mean that we have to consider how we present material to them um, and to support them as they, for lack of a better word, you know, suffer uh, through the difficulty of learning hard stuff. Okay. Well, so we agree that students are stressed, um, but the question is what to do about that. Do we adjust our teaching to make them less stressed, or do we do things to help make them stronger? And you actually gave an example where you did things to make them stronger. Now, the increase in depression and anxiety is actually larger among white and Asian students than it is among African American students. Um, it's uh, so I, I want to really keep apart these issues of human capital. That's because they're that, right, but that's because but, they they have they have higher rates of other types of metabolic illnesses. I mean, it, depression, anxiety, are metabolic illnesses, and so is heart disease and diabetes. OK, but I just, I just want to keep separate the issues about, about food insecurity and money versus um, uh, words, language, stress about social interactions. Just, just keep them separate for now, because that's what I really want to, I think, what we need to focus on here. Um, so you, you talked about how students are exposed on sitcoms to, to uh, uh, people making fun of each other or, or bullying. Um, from reading Steve Pinker and just from having been alive and watching TV in the 70s, the amount of violence or threatened violence, the, 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 um, the sensitivity is, seems much greater now than it was then. Um, I, the, uh, I, I'd like to uh, put on the table here this concept of anti-fragility, I think is the main idea that we need to bring into the conversation. We both refer to it in our articles. Um, and so it's the, it's the idea that um, we actually, our, our nervous systems actually need stimulation to grow. Our nervous systems are anti-fragile. The analogy is the immune system, why are peanut allergies going up? It's actually because we've been protecting kids from peanuts. And uh, in fact, they just came out with the first cure for peanut allergy. It's peanut dust. 
you give people little bits of peanut dust when they're young, and then their immune system develops it. And so the issue of teasing and things like that, in my kids' school, teasing is called bullying. There's no teasing. And I think this is horrible. This is absolutely horrible. Because humans are a social species in which we do competition and cooperation. Um, teasing is a normal part of growing up. We do have to be cognizant of bullying, which is where someone is picked on for days. It, 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 so it, bullying can't be a single episode, at least that was the old definition. Um, we, we don't want to protect kids so much that we ban teasing. We want, if we do that, what we're doing is we're adapting them to an extremely low stress environment. Uh, we're preparing them for a world that doesn't exist. And this is what I fear we're doing on college campuses. Um, but who is the Greek orator who would put pebbles in his mouth to? De thank Demosthenes, thank you. So Demosthenes had a speech impediment, and so he would put pebbles in his mouth so that, because he was preparing to argue his family's case before the court at Athens, which was the people. And because he had a speech impediment, he would practice by putting pebbles in his mouth, so when he took him out, he could speak better. And he would run up a hill and give his oration at the top of a hill so that when he was uh, in the court in Athens, and he wasn't out of breath, it would be easier. And Olympic athletes train at high altitudes so that their bodies will adapt to the thin atmosphere so that when they're down at sea level, they're stronger. And what we do in college campuses is the exact opposite of that. What we do is we say, we're going to do everything we can to clear out microaggressions, insults, anything that's upsetting. We're going to clear that out, give you four years, so that when you go out into the real world, when you go get a job, you will find it completely intolerable. And so I, th I think that at least if we just focus on, uh, again, monetary issues, uh, threats of violence, those are, those are fair, I would be with you enough, on. Fair enough. But, but teasing and, and, and this sort of, of words are upsetting and that's stressful, I think we need to not reduce it. We need to prepare them to deal with it because they're going to deal with it the rest of their lives. Yeah, so I just have a couple of things to say. First of all, I know you want to keep separate food insecurity and all of those things separate from, um, you know, uh, dealing with um, difficult topics, but what I'm actually saying is biologically you just can't. It would be very convenient to, but it, we just can't. The fact that we have so many students who are encumbered, that their nervous systems are encumbered, means that they are more vulnerable. It doesn't mean that they're fragile. They have, look, we, we are not snowflakes. We are humans, and we have human nervous systems. And those human nervous systems have fairly predictable responses to chronic stress. And your brain doesn't really care where the stress comes from. It doesn't matter to a brain whether the stress is uh, intended or not, whether it's food related or whether it's lack of sleep or whether it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Let me, just, let me just finish, please. That, and I agree with you, teasing is not the same as bullying, however, if you have a child who's been bullied, when that child actually is exposed to teasing, they will experience it. Their nervous system will respond as if it is bullying. That doesn't necessarily mean that, um, uh, that the responsibility is all with that child, right? But the point is that we have to make a distinction between um, uh, what is teasing to one person is actually the, their nervous to another person. Their nervous system responds as if it's bullying. That's not fragility. That's the reality of how nervous systems work. And and for us to ignore that, I think, is irresponsible. But you, but you're you're speaking as though there's a direct line between what happens and the nervous system. No, I'm and not actually. I'm saying what? that. I mean, I'm not going to give you a lecture on how your nervous systems work. Although I do actually think. It's very important that you understand how your brains work, which is why I wrote this other book, which is called Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. Um, and it's written actually for people who don't really care about science, but might be interested to understand how their brains work for exactly this reason. So microaggressions you mentioned, I think that's, you know, that's a place probably where we agree and probably many people in this audience will not like what I'm about to say. Um, but you know, the research shows pretty clearly like I said before, that you are not reading someone's expressions. You don't read someone's, um, there is no such thing as body language. Movements and vocalizations are not a language for you to read like words on a page. Your brain is making an inference. The whole problem with microaggressions is the assumption that there is an aggressive intent, even though 
which might not be there, even though there might be an aggressive impact. And that's the thing that we're grappling with in mm -hmm. part. And we want to say, well, who's responsible then? Right? So I just want to be really clear. Microaggressions, the way that they're used, assumes that because someone experiences something as aggressive and their nervous system might respond as if it's aggressive, that therefore it's aggressive. And that's, right. as scientists, okay, so we, we would, would both, yeah, we would so both that's agree that that's, that, that that's uh, problematic. Yeah. However, we, we, tend to, we tend to go from there to make the, inf to make the assumption that therefore um, the person who is experiencing the um, aggression is the only one who's responsible and I, for that. And I would say, if I, as an educator, if I, uh, I care as much about say, having the freedom to say what I want um, as much as I care about actually being heard. I speak in a way to my students, or at least I try, so that I am heard. In this country, we care much more about the freedom of speech than we do about whether or not we're actually heard. And that we have to take more responsibility for speaking in a way to allow us to be heard. And so I guess, yeah, I think if there's a student who I... Um, have good reason to believe might experience my facial movements or my um, tone of speech or whatever as a microaggression, even though that is not my intent, um, I think it is my responsibility to speak in a way that will allow them to hear what I want them to hear. That is my responsibility. And if we don't accept that responsibility, we won't achieve the goals that we have as educators. That, that's just the reality of, of the kinds of nervous systems we have. OK, so I can certainly accept that as, as not just norms change, but as, as the makeup of the students change, um, diversity does require that we all think more carefully and certain kinds of speaking or jokes that might have been acceptable in the 70s and 80s are not acceptable now. So I would agree with you that as educators, we all do have to think twice and, and keep thinking. Um, but the, the, the point I wanted to put out here is the basic Stoic and Buddhist insight um, that we don't live, we don't react to the world as it is, we, act to the, we react to the world through our filters, and of course we agree on that. So, as, so this is the beginning of chapter two of The Coddling the American Mind. We begin with Epictetus's quote, what really frightens and dismays us is not external events themselves, but the way in which we think about them. It is not things that disturb us, but our interpretation of their significance. And I think what that means is that any university that embraces microaggression training and all of this whole, this whole set of ideas that encourages students to put on the least generous reading, that encourages students to interpret ambiguous situations as though they were acts of aggression as opposed to, as opposed to acts of clumsiness or carelessness. Um, in so many ways, and this was the Greg Lukianoff's original insight that led to this whole project, in so many ways, somehow on university campuses, we are training students to think in exactly the kinds of cognitive distortions that Greg had learned to stop doing when he was treated for suicidal depression by learning cognitive behavioral therapy. So I would just make the point that I agree with everything you say about the nervous system, but a big part of that nervous system is that it has some agency to reinterpret. And at universities, we should be doing everything we can to make people focus on intent more than impact. I, like I, I completely agree with you. Okay. I completely agree with you, um, except for the part about reacting to the world, because brains don't react to the world. No brain reacts to the world. None of your brains react to the world. No brain on this planet reacts to the world. Brains are architected, have evolved to predict. So when we talk about cognitive distortions, really, your brain is always predicting. It's predicting what you will see. It's predicting what you will hear. It's predicting what will happen in your body. And it's preparing your actions to engage with what is predicted without your awareness. So tr it is true, in fact, I have a TED talk exactly about this issue, right? It is true that you can retrain your brain to predict differently. Yeah. It's that's, that's what extremely we should be doing. hard <laughs> to change your interpretation in the moment. Yes. And if you don't have the metabolic resources 
to hear something difficult, you certainly don't have the metabolic resources to change your interpretation in the moment. That's actually a really metabolically costly endeavor. So How however, it is possible to train students. It is our responsibility to train students to um, have the tools to grapple with things that are hard. But we also have to teach them that they are, they do have an impact on other people. What they say, how they behave, impacts other people, just like our behavior impacts them. And we all have to appreciate this. And it's, it just requires more uh, thoughtfulness on our parts and more care than we may want to give. But there is a consequence if we don't. And we see that consequence playing out in our culture, just in, you know, uh, on a broad scale. So that was Jeannie's first question. Do you have another one for us? Well, <laughs> I don't. I don't have a first, I don't have another question. I, I have one, I just have one thing I, I want to bring together. Well, we started off, I think, with two, two strands being put on the table. One was the Tilo stand, mm -hmm. strand, and the other was the chronic stress strand. And it's, I think it's um, been really fascinating to see how they have come together in the way that you all have um, debated this. But it does seem to me that at some point, I think what Lisa's saying is that the chronic stress strand actually interferes with the telos Absolutely. of a university. Yeah. Would, and that was actually yeah. why I wrote that article to begin with, actually. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was exactly why. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that our, our audience would be, um, I'm guessing that they're eager to ask us some questions or make comments and, and participate in this dialogue as well. So I think there are microphones. Yes. I don't need a microphone. I Please, I think that. So I want to come back to the question of what do you do next? Um, I'm a law professor downtown at Suffolk University Law School. I also serve on a city council. So I'm very interested in the question of discourse in two domains, obviously public and, and nonprofit. I guess I would ask if we're trying to help both our citizens and our students do better as part of this uh, collective inquiry that overcomes biases. Um, what guidelines would you offer as sort of ground rules to sort of set the stage for how these conversations can go forward successfully so that we protect the vulnerable but also encourage them to develop the kind of immune systems that you seem to argue that we should develop? You go ahead, and okay. I'll, I'll respond. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's that's a great question. That is the question that the leader of leaders of every educational institution, from kindergarten through graduate school, should be thinking. Because if they don't think that, if they don't take steps, then what's going to happen uh, is the the generational change is is going to change the the institution in ways that will make it less able to meet its goals. So one thing that's happened for the generation that's been raised with social media is that life is much more of a performance. Communication is much more likely to take place with large audiences than with private uh, private one-on-one -on -one settings. And when communication is done for performance, then it's very unlikely that we're going to have the kind of progress that we've been talking about here that comes from putting people into contact with each other. So for one thing, I think leadership needs to define um, leadership needs to define clear norms and goals and values. Leadership must. Uh, have a clear moral narrative about what we're doing together and why. And that's why we justify these rules, these norms. Um, so one of the important norms is no intimidation ever. You make your points, you give evidence, and you never intimidate. Uh, and that can, intimidation is unfortunately rising in all sectors, from the right, from the left, um, um, harassment, trolling, um, the threat of social destruction. A report just came out from the University of North Carolina showing that, uh, what Lisa and I were talking about before, in general, it turns out that professors aren't really to blame here in terms of students don't fear that their professors are going to shut them down if they give a wrong opinion. They're afraid of each other. And this is what comes out over and over again. Um, the students are afraid of each other. And um, it's not that most students are, are difficult or going to use intimidation, but a few will. And there's a few in every group. And so leadership must make clear this is inappropriate. You respond to people's arguments with arguments. You don't shame them, try to cancel them, those sorts of things. So um, 
uh, setting norms, um, training. Um, so me and my colleagues have developed a program called Open Mind. If you go to openmindplatform.org, it teaches you why it's good to engage with people who are different from you. It teaches you skills for starting those conversations. Um, so I think leadership of all educational institutions must take very active steps to define what they're doing based in moral virtues of the institution, provide training because there is a window in those first weeks when students show up, there's a window on which either you set the new norms or the other students will set the new norms. And so uh, this really falls on leadership to a large extent. And for the most part, what I've seen is that leadership tends not to rise to the challenge. They tend to wait until something blows up and then they are in defensive mode and then there's no good resolution. I think it's really clear. I mean, we, I think that uh, it's really clear, for example, that repetitive, unambiguous feedback is really how you retrain a mind. Clinicians know this, and, and um, other training um, uh, programs know this too. I think setting norms is really important because evolutionary biologists are also really clear. We copy each other, we learn from each other. It's actually one of our major adaptive advantages of species, and we do it without even realizing yeah. it. Um, and um, I would agree that it's really important to make a distinction between communication and um, uh, entertainment. Yeah. We confuse education and entertainment. We confuse a presidential election and entertainment. We confuse a lot of things with entertainment um, that, that, are more, that have really serious implications. So there are really, there's really basic science about how to have a discourse where you are, um, where you're more likely to be heard and where you are more likely to process what someone else says. So you can not intimidate, but you can also ask. You can just be curious. You can ask, how did you understand what I just said? And you can make corrections and you can also reflect back to people what they said um, and, and give them the opportunity to make corrections. It's really about creating space for people to actually communicate with each other and being respectful. There's really no shame in treating each other with human dignity as we disagree. And it, it, it's just, um, we seem to have somehow lost that uh, um, or somehow seen it as a kind of weakness. That, um, But the fact is that you will be more likely to be heard. Your own point will be more likely to be heard if you speak to another person and engage them with a basic amount of respect for human dignity. Other questions? Hi, thanks, Mr. Hi, it sounds like part of your argument depends on the idea um, that the universities, by becoming more sensitive to different types of um, psychological systems, I don't know the right terminology, but it sounds like you think that's bad preparation for the real world, as you put it, which is harsher. Um, and I'm just thinking, why not condemn the real world, as you call it, and say the universities need to be the torchbearer, and we need to become more sensitive here and hopefully lead the way, make the world, the real world, more sensitive to different types of people. Um, so I, I see the logic in that, but let's, let's play it out. Um, um, certainly, when we're talking about violence and uh, uh, you know um, sexual harassment and all sorts of things, um, yes, we uh, we we uh, I would say are leading the way uh, in creating more sensitive environments that then get translated out into the world of business and elsewhere. Um, but think about how how far you want to go. One of the guiding dictums of our book is. Uh, prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child. Now, it would be one thing if you had absolute authority over all the roads in the world, you could say, how about let's make sure there are never any pebbles or potholes on any road, and then, you know, then we can be sure that our, our students don't need to learn how to step over a puddle or a, or a pothole. But that's not the case. In fact, I'm actually very worried that um, students graduating now from American universities, so I teach in a business school at, at Stern, and students graduating now from American business schools, undergraduate in particular, many of them are going to work for multinational corporations. They're going to go overseas, and they're going to find it completely intolerable. So until we can control all the social norms, all the forms of address, all the ways that people greet each other, all the ways that people socialize after work in Japan, India, Guatemala, until we can control all of that, 
I think we're better off preparing our students for the road rather than the road for the students. But I think I think what the what the person is asking really is shouldn't we be maybe preparing our students to build new roads? Oh sure, for but yes, and, but and as long as they don't not, have the delusion and, that they will be able to pave the entire world, and no, I think some no. of them think that they should have that right. No, well that that may or may not be ca the case. I, I don't know what people think. Um, uh, I try really hard not to presume um, and instead ask. But I would say we uh, need to be maybe um, preparing our students as we prepare our students to deal with what's out there. We also need to be preparing them for the possibility that they will be the leaders of the future and they will have the opportunity to build new roads. And we aren't really talking about a sensitive environment. We're mm -hmm. talking about a thoughtful, respectful environment. Those are really yeah. not necessarily no. the same thing. Okay, but if we're going to prepare them to change the world, and in fact, I think Yale did change its purpose. Yale used to have something about truth in its motto, but they changed their mission statement to be about improving the world, something like that. The most important thing we could we could um, do to prepare them to do that is give them some sense of humility, some sense that things are really complicated. And what I see happening in activism, beginning as early as middle school, but certainly in high school in this country, is such certainty about good and evil, such a willingness to go in and change institutions that they do not understand, um, and we're all supposed to applaud them for it. And I think that this is ultimately foolish and self-destructive. The Parkland students, are, to me, are the model of good activism. They did research. They did research on gun control. I used to run a gun control group. I know a lot about the topic. I read their, their, the document that they prepared. It was brilliant. They did a lot of research. They went to Tallahassee. They argued for a bill. Now, they ultimately failed, um, but at least they took the time to understand the question before they just went out and tried to change the world. Yeah, and I think what you're pointing out is actually something really important, and I think that we both would agree on, I hope, as scientists, right? And that is that there is research yeah. on a lot of top on a lot of these topics that actually could be brought to bear and in rarely way, is that in yeah. a way that's really helpful and that inferences that are based on anecdotes and you know like individual sense of certainty um, is probably not the way to go you know when one thing that you can tell people is when you feel really strongly certain about something this is what we tell our own students when you react very um, you would say, I think, emotionally. I would probably say affectively. Those are actually different in our um, in our in I'll our, refer to you on that. our professional. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, when you hear something and you think immediately, your reaction immediately is, "I that's a that, of course that's that's absolutely right." Or that person is out of their mind. That is the most insane thing I've ever heard. In both of those cases, you should stop and reflect for a minute. Because when you hear something that you love, that means that whatever that is has touched a deeply held belief and validated it. And that's an opportunity for you to learn what that belief is and question it. And when you hear something that you think that person is just full of, uh, I'm trying not to use colorful language, I mean, respectfully in a law school with a university president here. Um, uh, uh, you know, then um, that is also an opportunity for you to pause and ask yourself, well, what did I hear that just violated some deeply held belief that I have? I think, I think the issue really is questioning our own you know, certainty. And again, what I will point out is, you know what one of the hardest things for a nervous system is? Uncertainty. It's metabolically costly to do that. So again, I would just come back to the point that all these things that we're, we really want our students to do and that we can, there is science that helps us understand how to teach students to do these things, have a price tag. That price tag is a metabolic price tag. Right? It's not a monetary, um, I suppose everything comes down to that, but it is a metabolic price tag. And we just have to appreciate that um, uh, as we um, invite our students to do it. Um, Mr. How, do, how, how do you decide uh, what free speech is 
what a speaker's motivation is in, in advocating ideas and who decides who can speak and to whom and, and how, do you, how do you protect those who aren't emotionally disabled from hearing the ideas in terms of the presentations and the limitations on speech at the, at the university? Well, I, I'll, there are many questions embedded in the one question that you just asked. So um, I'll just start with what I think is the easier question, which is, um, so when we decide who to invite to speak, we aren't... Um, Does anyone have the right to invite, or can you say we? No. Well, I think it depends... It depends on the campus. I think it depends... Well, I think... I think it depends on, I think it's a, who has the right? I mean, there, uh, there are many constituencies in a university who have the decision rights of, of who to speak, of who should be invited to speak. I think, so I think the trickiest bit is, um, I don't think for, well, I don't know, actually, I wouldn't even say that. I, I think uh, there are, no one should be prevented from having decision rights, but I do think that it is our responsibility as educators to help students consider what their goal is in who they're inviting, what are they hoping will happen, and um, helping students to prepare if they decide to invite someone like a Charles Murray who is going to incite, even, uh, you know, even if it's all done you know, uh, respectfully, who is going to in, incite, by virtue of his um, science, uh, it will feel offensive and it will incite uh, discontent in people. I think that students should have decision rights, as faculty do. <clears throat> the issue is, what is the goal? Like, what is the goal? What is your goal? Is your goal an educational goal? Is your goal an entertainment goal? Is your goal um, uh, to incite uh, um, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, just seed this, sow the seeds of discontent and incite violence. Um, I think that the issue isn't really who has the right to decide. The issue is more, because many people have decision rights on a campus, it's more what's the goal, and some goals should not be, are not conducive to an educational context, I would say. Um, I, I, building on what Lisa just said, the, the model that American universities, especially uh, research universities in, in the last 50 or 100 years, 50 years, has been, it's been very much open, decentralized. There's a lot of ferment, activity, all kinds of ideas. Uh, you know, if, if you're the, you know, you can be the, the, the political union, you invite all kinds of speakers from the right and the left to invite, you don't, need you don't need permission from the president. You can just invite people. That's always been the norm at the places that I've been at. Um, and that fits with our, that fits with our, our view of ourselves, that fits with our sense of a wide open place where all ideas are, 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 are welcome if they're gonna be contested. But I think that in recent years, and it really began around uh, 2013, 2014, uh, and I think it's in part because of the rise of social media, uh, the dynamics have changed because now the question has arisen without anybody addressing it, not who has the right to decide, but who has a veto. And the answer given on most campuses is, if a few students are loud enough, they have a veto. And um, even if the president almost never disinvites, although sometimes they have, like at Williams and other places, the presidents have disinvited speakers, which is shameful, I believe. Um, but the general response from universities uh, is, um, well, uh, if, students, if some students uh, get angry about it and threaten to disrupt it, well, then we'll cancel it. And that, I think, is also shameful. Um, the few universities that have laid down of clear rules and said, look, here are rules, like Ch Chicago did this, here are rules, uh, and if you violate them, if you disrupt, you know, how dare you, what right do you have to stop everyone else from hearing? If you do that, there will be punishments. And almost no school has actually administered any punishments, but um, Claremont McKenna is the only one I know of that did. Um, but the few that have actually said there will be consequences, they find that they don't then get disruption. So I think uh, every school needs to look very clearly at their policies. Um, and they all have policies about who gets to speak. And yes, you can stand at the back of the room and hold your signs. Everyone says that. But what they don't usually say is, but if you disrupt, the, if you prevent others from hearing, there will be consequences. They don't say that. And if you don't say that, then you'll get disruptions. In other words, you're giving a veto to anyone who's upset. And I that's a terrible state of Having those discussions in advance of inviting anyone is probably a really good idea. And in and of itself could be an intervention. 
I mean, I would suggest, for example, you know, if you want, if you invite someone on the left, then you should invite someone on the right, and then make them switch halfway through, <laughs> which we could have done. Yes. I mean, you know, that. so I, my point, even having a discussion with your students about who to invite, how to invite, how to protest, and what the goal is, in and of itself, is an intervention that teaches them something about the value of uh, speech and also its potential harms. Thank you. Both of us have helped us to try to reach our talos today. And I really would like to thank both of you for being willing to do this. Thank you.